Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to return to this, my Raspberry Pi Zero controlled Devastator robot. I made three videos about this robot a couple of years ago now, putting it together, sorting out its control, adding a camera on top so we could take pictures. It even took some of the footage in my last video in which it appeared when we took it out in the park. It was whizzing around photographing things. That was very exciting. But for some reason, I've forgotten it for a while, so I thought I'd come back to this robot. It's a really nice robot. And in particular in this video, I want to remind myself what was going on. I want to review the control code. And in particular, I want to implement speed control. So let's go and get started. Right, here we have our robot, which is based on the Devastator Tank mobile robot platform from DF Robot. And on the top, as you can see, we've got a Raspberry Pi Zero in a custom 3D printed bracket, which also holds a standard Raspberry Pi camera. And then here is a small extension lead going to a standard USB socket, which has got a dongle in it. That dongle is the dongle for this Rye wireless keyboard, which we're using to control the robot. So let's just take a look inside. And uh, there we are. We should now be able to lift off the top like that. Oh, we can. Oh, it's always inciting looking inside a robot, isn't it? And you can see in here, we've got a couple of motors. We've got an L298N motor controller, which connects to the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. And we've got a couple of power supplies here. Down here, we've got a AA battery pack, which has got six AA batteries in it. That's powering the motors. And we've also got a USB power bank that is powering the Raspberry Pi. And I did try running everything from the AA battery pack and using the voltage regulator on the L298N to give uh, five volts to the Raspberry Pi. I tried that, I think, in episode two, but in the end, it didn't work by the time I got to episode three when I added the camera on because the camera, when we turned it on and off, made things unstable. So now we've got two power supplies again, one powering the motors, one powering the, the Raspberry Pi. So let's put this all back together. And there we are, I had fun there dropping some screws. We're gonna put that piece of plastic under the robot again so we've got it supported off the table. And that's because I want to show you how it actually works. Let's make sure these wires are roughly out of the way. That'll do, or that'll, maybe that's what it's designed for. I don't know, I don't think so. Anyway, if we uh, turn on the power bank here, we should be able to uh, see something happen. Yes, one of the LEDs at the front has come on. Uh, this automatically runs some code when it is uh, turned on. I covered that auto starting the code in episode two. And once the thing is fully booted, both of the LEDs at the front should uh, turn solid. And I guess I should also turn on my uh, controller. There we are, that's all, all ready. Things are still going on. There we are, we now seem to be all ready for action. And I need to flick this button here, which used to turn on the Raspberry Pi. It now just connects the Raspberry Pi to the motor controller. Bit of a redundant switch. Now we're back to two power supplies. And then we have to turn on the switch can turn on the power to the motors, which isn't turned on initially because we won't know the GPIO state of the Raspberry Pi's pins until the code is run and put them into a clean state. So we do that. And in theory, as you can see, we can turn the uh, treads one way or the way we can spin them left, we can spin them right as well. And we can also here, I think, press the R key to start recording from the camera. We know that's happened because one of the LEDs goes off on the front. And we can press, I think it's the T key, to uh, stop recording on the camera. That was all covered in episode three recording video from this robot. And the only problem with this setup is that the way the keyboard control works, if I make sure you can see the keyboard control here, when I press this, I press that key, the robot starts off, doesn't stop till we press another key. And that's because the code we've got here doesn't actually detect keys being up or down. It simply knows when you press the key and when you pressed another key, which is the way it works. So let's for now close the thing down, which I think is a capital S like that. There we are, things seem to be happening. The light has gone off, everything is uh, shutting down. And uh, there we are, I think we're in a nicer stable state so we can flick off the power there. And so what I think we will now do is to connect this thing up to a monitor and a proper keyboard so we can take a look at the current code. 
And uh, here on a two-year-old Raspbian desktop, it is, this is the code currently running the robot, where we're using something called curses to read the keyboard, which can return the last key pressed in an open terminal window. And as you can see, we read in the library for curses there, we read in other libraries we need as well. We set up our camera, we set up some date functions we need for naming video files so they're unique. We set up all the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi to control the motors and the LEDs. We flash the LEDs when things start to make it very exciting. And then here, we've got the code which sets up curses to read the keyboard. And then we have a loop, and inside that loop, we basically check for particular keys using curses, Q to quit from the code, S to shut things down. We've got the code here which sets off recording with the camera and stopping recording. And then we've got code here which reads the keys to actually move the robot around to control the motors. And as we saw at the moment when we use this code, it doesn't know when you've released the key, so the control mechanism isn't fantastic. So what I'm going to do now is to go in search of a better method of reading the keyboard in Python. Right, here I am back again, where I've decided to switch to Pygame for robot control. Pygame is a set of Python modules intended for writing games, although here we're just going to use it to read the keyboard. And to show how this will work, I've written this piece of test code, which, as you can see, starts off by us importing the Pygame library. Next, we set the Pygame display mode, because just like in curses, Pygame can only detect user interactions, known as events, if a Pygame window is open and has the focus. So, I happen to be opening a window here which is 240 by 160 in size, but it could be any size of window. Next, we have an infinite loop, because while true is always true, and inside this loop we're going to be reading the keyboard. And what Pygame does is to register all user events, such as key presses, in an event queue. So, what the first piece of code we've got here does is to loop through the Pygame event queue, and inside that we can check for events such as key down over there and key up at the bottom. And then inside the key down events, we can check for particular keys. So here, for example, we're checking for the uh, cursor right, cursor left, cursor up, cursor down, basically these ones here. And we're going to print right, left, up and down, as you can see. And we're also going to check for the particular key Q being pressed, which we'll use to activate Pygame's quit function, because we should have a means of exiting the program. And then right at the bottom, if we've got key up as the event type, we're going to print no key pressed. So, in theory this should work, but I'm sure you'd like to see it in practice, so let's bring up a shot of the keyboard, and we'll actually execute this code. Shouldn't take a second, let it come up there. Raspberry High Zero will catch up with us. We'll shrink the screen a bit so you can't miss the edge. And if I now go to the keyboard, and I press up, hold down the key, it says up, release the key, no key pressed. Down, no key pressed. Left, right. As you can see, that is doing what we will need to do. And just to make the point about the active window up here, here's the Pygame window we opened up, the small window which has got the focus. If we go the focus to the terminal window here and press the key, you'll see things don't work properly. If we went back and gave the Pygame window the focus again, things would work okay. That's back to how things work. And I've got Q set up to quit as we saw, so I pressed Q like that, it'll quit. It'll give us an error. Why? Because the Pygame window is closed down, video system is not there, so we get the error, which is not a problem. So, if we press enter on that, we get rid of that, and we've now established the principle of how we're going to read the keyboard. So, all I now need to do is to integrate this code into our robot's control program. Greetings! Here I am, back again, and I've now updated the robot's control code, so initially it imports Pygame rather than Curses, and also sets the Pygame display mode, so we've got an active Pygame window, as I was just discussing. Other than that, the code hasn't changed at all till we get down to the main loop, where we are now going to be cycling through the Pygame event queue, as we were in our example code, looking for the key down events, and also the key up events down there. And we're doing the same things we were previously in terms of function. We're looking for the Q key in terms of quitting. We're looking for the S key in terms of shutting the system down. The R key turns on recording. The T key turns off recording. And then we've got down here looking for the cursor keys to control the robot moving around. 
And the way this works is that the two motors on the robot are linked to the motor controller, the L298N, which uses two GPIO pins to control each motor, with one GPIO pin being used to move the motor forwards and the other to move it backwards, and we got that for each motor. And so what we see here under each of the conditions of pressing a cursor key is what is happening with each motor in terms of whether it's going forward or reverse. So under the right cursor arrow, we've got one motor spinning in one direction, one the other, opposite for left. Key up, which is forwards, both motors go forward. Key down, both motors go backwards. And then the cool thing here compared to our previous code is we can also detect key up and set all the motors to be off. So the motors will only spin when we've got a key being pressed. So let's try this out. Let's uh, run the code and go over to a shot where we can see the robot itself. And I've also got the Rai keyboard connected up so we can actually see it on screen much easier than moving around the keyboard, which is uh, back here. So hopefully I can just make this thing come, come alive. It's gone to sleep. There we are. But hopefully it's now woken up. And uh, yeah, as you can hopefully see, when I press a key, it moves. When I release a key, it doesn't which is exactly what we want for controlling our, our robot. That's very good. And in theory, if we wanted to record, it's what the R key, like that. And that's uh, worked. It's turned off all of the little lights to well starting recording. And I think the T key takes us back and, and finishes recording. And if we press a Q here, we should be able to quit. I can't find the Q upside down. There we are, QWERTY, you fool. There we are. That's right. And that's quit out of it. So there we are. Everything is working. Don't worry about these runtime warnings. It's just because the GPIO pins had already been initialized. We've done it more than once, but that's not a problem. So we've got some code here which seems to be working fine. So let's now go and test it in the wild. Right, here I am outside where the robot is going through its boot process. There we are, just finishing off that little flashing LED, that's the exciting bit of the code. And if we turn on the motors and cross our fingers, hopefully, yes, the robot is alive. It can uh, move around, slipping a bit there. That's uh, difficult to get in exactly the right position, but our Pi game control is, is working. Let's uh, drive it forwards. And can it corner? Yes, it can. And along like that. Obviously, it goes backwards as well. That's cool. Very good. Shall we turn on its camera to record something? So let's do that. And uh, yes, one of its lights has gone out. I've just had a check. So in theory, you can now see what it's seeing. And uh, we can move it on, spin it around. Yes, that's, this seems to be working very nicely. There we are. That's no problems at all. Yes, the robot is definitely functional. So uh, I think that's fine as a test of the Pi game controller, but what I'd now like to do is to get the robot with some speed control. Right, I'm now opening the robot up again as we need to add some wiring to the L298N motor controller. As we can see, there are currently four cables that connect to GPIO pins on the Pi, two for each motor, with one running the motor forwards and the other backwards. However, there are also two extra pins on either side of the main block, each of which is currently fitted with a jumper to keep its value high. And with this jumper on, the motor it controls will run at full speed. However, if we remove the jumpers and add two new jumper leads, we can connect these to two more GPIO pins on the Pi, which we're going to configure as PWM, or pulse width modulation, outputs. What this means is that these pins will output a square wave pulse, the length or duty cycle of which will control the speed of the motor. So let's put the robot back together and connect our new leads to GPIO pins 12 and 32, which is probably easier to see on this circuit diagram, which you can find on the Expanding Computers webpage for this project. Next, let's boot things up and go back to the robot's control code. Here we are, where I've made a couple of changes. And the first is down here, where I've set up all the PWM stuff. And first of all, I've just defined pins 12 and 32 as GPIO outputs. And then I've defined below here, speed left and speed right, to use these pins with a PWM frequency of 100 Hz. 
And to be honest, I wasn't sure what frequency to use with the L29A10 controller, but 100 hertz seems to work okay. And then finally here, I've started both speed left and speed right running with their duty cycle or pulse width set to 100%. So this 100 means that we're going to be running each motor at full speed initially. Second thing I've done is down in our main loop, the thing that controls the keyboard, as I'm sure you remember. And so down here, what I've done is to set up some keys for changing the robot's speed. And so as you can see, it looks for key one. And if key one is pressed, it changes the duty cycle for speed left and speed right to 33. And if key two is pressed, it changes it to 66. And key three is pressed, it puts it to 100. So effectively, we've got one, two, and three as three different speeds of the robot. So let's run this code and go across to a shot of the robot and pick up its controller. And it should still work. If we just try the buttons. That should be on full speed, that's the default. But if I press the, the one key here, we should go down to the lowest speed. That should be a little slower than number three, which is, oh, definitely, yes. And then speed two in the middle, back to speed one, and up to speed three. Yes, we've definitely got some speed control. Although, once again, I want to test this properly outside. Right, here I am back again out in the wilds of the garden with the robot, which is uh, functional, as you can see. That's currently working at speed three. But if I press the uh, one key, crawling along there at a speed one, and this is a speed two. And there's no doubt at all, if you want speed three, as we saw earlier, it's a little bit tricky to point the robot exactly where you want to. But go down to speed one though, it struggles. I think it hasn't got enough power to pull against the ground. If we could put, go to the second speed though, there we are. So there's, there's a lesson in this, you shouldn't drop your PWM value, your duty cycle value too low, all the motors won't turn when they've got any load on them, when like, for example, the robot's actually trying to move along. But uh, let's go back to speed three wander along. Can I just get you coming towards me slightly, get up to speed two on the turning? Oh, I'm getting better at this. And uh, let's turn on the camera. Let's be uh, recording. There we are. You should be able to see things now. You can probably see the camera. It's weird, of course. I can't see what you can see, but let's uh, drive towards me. Like this, you're going off camera. We'll go to the robot's view there. Come along here. And hopefully, let's go to speed two and turn round. This is an adventure for the robot move forwards up to speed three whizzing along down here oh it found a stone there it's going along next to the wall we'll go to speed two and just uh, this is like a secret mission isn't it finding out what is going on we're looking purely through the robot's point of view i like the fact the robot's filming its own video there we are there's some bricks there those are bricks look and we can just go along i could play with this all day oh there's a stick that's definitely a stick I think it's a stick. It's a stick. There we are. Can we go over the stick? Yes, we went over the stick perfectly well indeed. So there we are. The robot has gone off all by itself. And I think we can call this a successful test. So there we are. We have quite literally got the Devastator robot moving again. It's great to see it back in action. And the code I've been working on here is all available from its page on the Explaining Computers website. That code, I think, will also be useful in a future project I've still got in mind, which is to build a Raspberry Pi controlled hovercraft, which I still hope to do sometime in 2021. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.